This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to Anaheim United Methodist Church. I am Pastor James Dollins. It is a joy to worship with our congregation and with other friends who are visiting with us in this video recorded worship. We are at home and in different places in the world, but we are one in spirit. Uh, we continue this Easter season, this sixth Sunday of the Easter season, to study the theme Easter people, what it means to be made in the likeness of the risen Christ, how to live in the love that he shares with us so that we might live now and live forever as he lives forever. Today our theme is sacred friendships, as Jesus teaches us about the quality of friendships which typify Easter people living. Let us uh, enjoy those lessons of Jesus today. Also, thank you so much for all those who could join us in in-person in uh, in worship last week. We had over 70 people worshiping here and practicing social distancing and wearing those masks. We thank everyone for doing your, doing your best to keep each other safe. If all goes well, we will be able to resume with a new uh, in-person service on the um, 6th of June, and that will then begin weekly in-person worship. Let's hope that um, our county and our regions just get better and better and that the um, incidence of COVID begin continues to reduce. Now let us lift our hearts in worship and our voices in songs of praise. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from 1 John 4, 13 to 21. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as a savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he loved us. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers and sisters, 
are liars. For those who do not have a brother or a sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment that we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and their sisters also. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second scripture this morning comes from John 15, 12 through 17. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because a servant does not know what the master does but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me before I offer a message this morning? Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Jesus teaches us a new lesson about what it means to live as Easter people today. He calls us to seek sacred friendships, both with one another and with God. Last Sunday, we discussed the connection God calls us to have, that we should keep connected as a, a vine is connected both to God and to one another. But today, Jesus deepens those connections. He calls us to have a more profound and genuine friendship with one another that can mean so much more and teach us such great things. It's fitting that we would talk about this and read these scriptures on Mother's Day because this is really a story in the Bible about what it means to practice incarnational love, to put love in human form, just as God's love was made human in Jesus Christ. And on Mother's Day, of course, we honor those who did this for us from our very birth, those of us who had very nurturing and loving mothers and were blessed to have that love. We experienced it firsthand. This was our first 
lesson about God's love, that love that was conveyed to us through our mothers, our parents. Uh, there's a story of a young child who's having trouble falling asleep and um, is having to learn how to go to bed in his own room all by himself. Um, it's getting late and the mother tries various times to comfort the child and says, go to sleep, honey. And after several times, she says, son, I'd like to tell you that even though I'm not here to help you go to sleep, you can always pray to God because God is always here. God will help you go to sleep. God is going to love you with the same motherly love that I love you with. And she went back to bed, getting kind of exhausted. And in a few moments, she heard, Mom, and she went back into the room and said, Honey, you didn't even try to pray to God and ask for God to help you. And the child said, Yes, I did but I want someone with soft skin. This is what we all need, and it's a reasonable expectation. In fact, it is a true need. Babies need those embraces and the love and affection of uh, a warm touch, or early in their lives, if they're orphaned and don't have any of that touch, their very lives are at risk. We all need that affection. We need God incarnate in human form and in human friendships. This is one of the reasons it's been so hard over this past year and a half to be away from our hugs and our handshakes. Some people in our church say that the hugs that we used to give each week are the only hugs that they have all week long. Imagine going without those, the spiritual poverty, and so how important it is to call one another and at least do what we can to send each other air hugs. Here's one for you now, and let's uh, send them whenever we have a chance. Whatever gestures we can do to get by, we need to hear our, one another's voices and those gestures of love. And so during the night before Jesus would die, he said these words to his disciples. He called them his friends, and this was a revolutionary idea. God wasn't considered a friend to people. God was considered our creator, the lawgiver, our judge. But in this moment when the disciples needed to hear it the very most, the night before Jesus would be killed the next day, crucified and killed, he drew those disciples very close and he called them his friends. He says, you are my friends. No one has greater love than this to lay down his life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do as I command you. Jesus no longer called his disciples servants. They didn't have to call him rabbi that night or teacher or master. They were on an equal footing all of a sudden. This friendship is something that we dearly need. And we see that the same love is uh, explained in 1 John 4, verse 18, which we also heard read today. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God. We heard some of these same words in the previous passage last week. So there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. How many times has the love of our friends rescued us from our fear, from our panic? We think about those closest friends to our hearts, or, or maybe our parents, or a loved one, or a spouse, or perhaps a talented therapist who's become a good friend who knows how to calm our nerves and pull us out, pull us off of the brink of disaster when we're panicked and afraid. It's invaluable that we have these kinds of friends, sacred friendships. And we have survived this pandemic, this season of social isolation as a church, largely because of those contacts. Many of us are doing okay. It was good to see that this last Sunday and see proof of it when we gathered in person. We've made it all right, and it's because of those contacts and those sacred friendships that we share. So how important it is that we not treat friendship like some accidental thing. 
And some of our devotions, especially last month in the, um, from the center of, at, center of contemplation and action, we learned that um, friendship has a sacred and ancient meaning as the crown of life, the most important experience of Christians or of anyone. That that love which we share when we join our hearts in friendship, when we join our hearts as one, is something that cannot be taken for granted. It's not just an accident that we make friendships with people at work, and um, we shouldn't just allow our friendships be formed by these accidental acquaintances. No, we have to put effort into them. We have to treat them as something sacred to us. In order to do this, I'd like to offer a few of the Scripture's guidelines about friendship. Um, scripture teaches us that friendship should be mutual, it should be committed, and it should help us to grow. When we say that friendship should be mutual, we might think of a passage from the book of Romans, Paul's letter to that early church in Rome, where he says, let love be genuine. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Love one another with mutual affection. I found over the years of my ministry that as I counsel couples or friends or different pairs of people, groups of people, this principle of mutuality is essential. Whenever a married couple comes in and there's not mutuality and one person is giving much more than they're receiving and vice versa, that relationship is really doomed to failure. Mutuality is a vital litmus test for the health of a relationship. And we might ask ourselves, are my relationships mutual? Am I giving as much as I'm receiving? And vice versa. It must be a healthful give and take so that each of us receives in unique ways in that relationship, whether in a marriage or in a friendship or any other relationship. Our love should be mutual. Our love must also be committed. I remember in my uh, junior high years, in my high school years, I had a committed friend. His name was Frank. He's my, he was my best friend from those years. Frank is a very plain-spoken person. And there was a time during high school when I wasn't keeping in touch very well with Frank. And one day he called me and he said, where have you been? You're my best friend. Why haven't you called me? I don't know anything that's going on with you right now. You got to call me, dude. Pick up the phone. And he gave me this wonderful scolding over the phone like that. And it woke me up and it made me realize what a friend, a true friend should be. And I made a, more of an effort after that. And we grew closer together once again. Later on in my life, I thought, that's kind of how faith works too, isn't it? Sometimes I realized during my college years especially, I would say that God was my best friend, but I rarely stopped what I was doing to talk to God. I rarely picked up the phone to call. I thought how God must be saying much of the same things that Frank was saying. Where are you, dude? Talk to me. I thought you said I was your best friend. Why don't you treat me like it? And I began to make more of an effort to have regular check-ins with God, which I continue today and which have been a greater blessing in my life. Our friendships with God, our friendships with others must be treated with care. We must value them for what they really are. Of course, we see this in Scripture with today's passage where Jesus says those words, no one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. The ultimate commitment, of course. Jesus said this and then did that very thing the next day, showing the ultimate commitment to his disciples. Friendship must be mutual, it must be committed, and it must help us to grow. And one of the best ways to do this is to make friends who are different from ourselves, to learn from them. 
This is a vital skill in our world today, in the diversity of our society today. The best way that we can overcome prejudice and divisions between us is to simply forge friendships. It's been such a blessing for me to forge friendships with some of our Muslim neighbors up the road. We've had them come to our church and we've enjoyed wonderful fellowship and meals together. Um, Jamal Zahin, who has uh, joined me for lunch, he and I have had wonderful exchanges and friendships. One of, a similar story was told by, uh, in one of our devotions from the Center for Action and Contemplation devotion uh, this past April, where Reverend Ma Brian McLaren talks about a friendship that taught him a great deal. McLaren was praying to God after the September 11th attacks, what should we do? Brian McLaren is a nationally well-known uh, evangelist. He's an evangelical preacher. And he was praying, God, how will we heal from these attacks? And what should we do now? And he says he heard God's voice say, your Muslim neighbors are in danger of reprisals. You must try to protect them. And Brian obeyed God's spirit and went out of his own church, out of his own comfort zone, and started visiting some mosques. A couple of them seemed to be um, unavailable or closed, but the third mosque that he visited was available to his visit, and he asked if he could see a leader of the mosque, and he was introduced to the imam, the mosque's leader. He then told the imam why he was there, that God called him to go and befriend someone from this community. How could he help to ensure their safety? And this imam threw his arms around Pastor Brian and hugged him forcefully. And they've remained friends ever since, and they continued to learn from their friendship with one another. Throughout Scripture, we have many examples of this. Jesus constantly was making friends in this way, whether with a Samaritan woman of a different faith and a different gender of, from himself, or the story of the Good Samaritan, where a Samaritan is the one who helps the injured and beaten Jewish man. They forge a friendship of help and aid. This is what we're called to do. Brian McLaren sums up his devotion saying, it's one thing to say you love humanity in general, whatever their religion. It's quite another to learn to love this or that specific neighbor with his or her specific religion. So do you have a Sikh neighbor, a Hindu coworker, a Muslim business associate, a Buddhist member of your PTA? a new age second cousin, invite them into companionship over a cup of tea or coffee. Ask them questions. Display unexpected interest in them, their traditions, their beliefs, their stories. Enter their world and welcome them into your world without judgment. If they reciprocate, welcome their reciprocation. If not, Welcome their non-reciprocation. Experience conviviality. Join the conspiracy of plotting for the common good together. What a wonderful, whimsical invitation, but a serious one, that we would forge friendships with people who are different from us so that we might grow and learn to be what God would teach us to be who God would call us to become. Both in our current friendships and in relationships we have yet to forge, let us truly call one another friends as sincerely as Jesus calls us friends. Thanks be to God, it is these friendships that sustain us in these days and for all time. May can we continue to put genuine effort into these friendships in Christ's name so that we may bear better fruit for a world in need. May it be so. Amen.
Let us pray. We give thanks, dear Christ, that you meet us here and you call us your friends. You extend your hand of friendship freely to neighbors and to foreigners, women and men, to everyone who longs to know the peace of God. Help us to recognize you in the friends you give us. Guide us beyond our self-absorbed thinking and worrying to share in the joys and concerns of others. Teach us to both receive the help we need from others and to offer friendship to those who need us. Open our eyes to your spirit in the faces of all our neighbors, dear God, so we may grow in love and grace. We give thanks for the love of our mothers, and we pray that this weekend would be a blessed time for those who have given so much to raise children with love. We rejoice in the lesson of God's love that our mothers have taught us through their words and actions. Continue, O God, to heal this world so that we together may overcome sickness and the evils of war. Let us continue to overcome this pandemic as one world, keeping each other safe and doing our part. Guide us toward religious tolerance as we remember victims of an attack on a Sikh temple recently in Indianapolis. We pray for Christians and Muslims in Asian regions where religious minorities face unbearable religious persecution. Teach us in our friendships with one another to combat evil with the love of Jesus Christ. We give thanks for your church and ask your Holy Spirit's inspiration for all of its ministries as we feed the hungry, share the good news of Christ, and build one another up in love. Now hear our prayers in this time of silent prayer as we lift our honest prayers of thanksgiving, petition, and confession in a time of silent prayer. Holy Spirit, we give you thanks that you hear our praises, petitions, and confessions as we rest in the assurance that in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and loved. And so we join in the prayer that Jesus taught us using the contemporary version, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And in a spirit of thanksgiving and great gratitude, thank you for supporting the ministries of the church with your unfailing gifts as everyone continues to give generously of our time, our treasures, our talents, your, our energies and Christian service. Thank you. And let us ask God's blessing over these offerings together in this offertory prayer. God of love, help us to remember that Christ has no body now on earth but ours, no hands but ours, no feet but ours. Ours are the eyes to see the needs of the world, Ours are the hands with which to bless everyone now. Ours are the feet with which he is to go about doing good. Bless, O God, the work of our hands and these offerings for Christ's work in the world. Amen. <laughs>
Now, let us go from this time of worship to befriend God in the faces of all people we meet. And may the grace of Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit remain with us forevermore. Amen.